Hello, David McMillan here. Who the hell am I? Just a moment. In 1996, David McMillan was the only Westerner to escape a Thai prison. Born in London, he had a 40-year career as a drug smuggler, which took him all over the world. For decades, I ran a courier and contraband smuggling network across 50 cities, built my own equipment, created my own disguises, and used almost every device imaginable to escape detection. But his career law was being sentenced to death by firing squad in Thailand's maximum security prison, Klong Prem, in Bangkok, after being convicted of trafficking heroin. I've met the worst and the best of 10,000 criminals and know people at a glance, crossing borders, concealing goods, escaping, hiding and becoming something else. This is David's story. Klong Prem, Thailand. Tell me about it. Death Row, you were sentenced to the firing squad. Uh, well, no, luckily it hadn't come to that or I would have been no. transferred to the... Um, the death sentence block, but um, I knew it was coming. As I was saying before, I had all these crazy schemes, including one where we were going to go out by uh, pretending to be United Nations medical personnel to evacuate the sick or some stupid idea. No, it, it, it was just not going to come to I knew that I'd have to do it in old school, which is cut out of my cell. Uh, get to the ground they didn't trust foreigners by the way it was at least three floors up you had to be there then um get a ladder somehow and go to the prison wall climb over that and there was no there was no history of it Deca. i mean there was no that's why everybody backed out nobody's ever done it they said I, perfect perfect yeah that's why you know they won't be expecting it yeah but it, it you know, the ones who have tried, they've ended up being tortured to death over three months, which was true. And a couple of Israelis have come down from Chiang Mai and they'd got out and they got caught again and the prison guards smashed up their legs with iron bars and put rocks on top of them. So by the time we saw them, they had these big elephant chains on and their legs looked like all crushed, twisted drinking straws. I think that really put the uh, Swedish guy off coming with me. Uh, they handled it pretty well, those Israelis. But uh, my lawyer said, look, your, uh, your case is going to come to an end. It's been over two years now. And they're going to make an example of it. You'll be sentenced to death. And when you're so sentenced David, to... when, when they told you this, that yeah. you may be sentenced to death, what was the first thought in your head? It was exactly this. How much time have I got left before that starts to happen? Because I knew from <clears throat> watching it around me, when somebody comes back with a life or a death sentence, um, they take them straight out of their you know, comfort, if you want to call it comfort, um, and they get the heaviest chains put on. Oh, and they're welded on. Yeah, these chains are welded around your ankles with a C ring. And you know when they come off those chains? Well, <laughs> when you go into the execution chamber, which has a tilted board on it and a machine gun uh, also welded to the bench with three pieces of string around the trigger, also hanging from the wall is a machete. That's how those chains come off your legs. They're quite valuable, you know. They're not just scrap metal. They'll reuse those things. There's always somebody else getting the death penalty. From escaping a deadly fire inside the most notorious jail in Melbourne, Australia, to sawing his way out of a cell in Thailand, David, the Australian drug smuggler, relives 20 years of survival in the world's worst prisons. Tell well, me about the prisons, David. Tell yeah. me about the prisons. Okay, now I wasn't a stranger to prisons. I um, there'd been a big arrest in Australia because I, I didn't listen to my lawyer, told me to get out of Dodge City. No, I thought I won't be caught with anything. He said conspiracy. Yeah? 
What? No, somebody has to talk for that to work. No one will talk. <laughs> How's that for confidence? No, there was a huge trial there. It ran six months. There were 119 witnesses. There were 6,000 pages of telephone intercepts and bug tapes. It was a nightmare. These, this task force had been uh, on us for a long time, and we knew it. Um, I was uh, business partners with a, a guy who started working for me um, as a courier, but he went off to his own thing um, and, and kind of retired at 23. But he came to me with a uh, you know, uh, problem. And I, you know, Mr. Fix it, I stuck my stupid nose where I shouldn't have. Anyway, so I ended up getting this 10 year stretch. But as I was saying, the, the police were all over me when I, when I got out. I, I wasn't going to put up with that. I, I wanted freedom, really, after all those years. The prisons that I've been in in Australia, uh, because of the a helicopter escape that never came off, I ended up in. Um, a supermax prison. In fact, I, I'd been in there twice because, um, it, and it looked just like those supermax prisons in heaven in the US, you know, complete concrete cell, uh, all steel sink and toilet, uh, no opening windows, big, thick, bullet resistant glass. Now, in there, the first time I was in there because they had no real evidence in this case. They put a lot of pressure. They arrested all our families. And my wife was in prison. Michael, my business partner's wife, was in prison. They put an informer in their little dormitory in the women's prison. The informer set fire to the place. The girls died. My wife was dead. My business partner's wife was dead. Marie, she was Colombian. Now, uh, that kind of wrung me out completely. Uh, for a long time, I had no interest in the trial or anything. David travelled to Pakistan, where he lived under the protection of Mayor Nu Jian Magzi of the Magzi clan. He then began exporting drugs to Scandinavia. Macmillan was later arrested in Lahore, Pakistan, as a result of the confession of a captured courier. Macmillan was flown to Karachi, Pakistan, and held in the Karachi Central Jail. This jail maintained a class system for prisoners, through which Macmillan kept servants and private rooms. Due to a financial dispute with the prison superintendent concerning his illegal mobile phone, Macmillan was transferred overnight to the Hyderabad jail, where he kept in the dungeons until being rescued by Lord Magsy. Did you used to um? Did you used to enjoy the planning of the drug smuggling, David? Yeah, mostly that, um, and and making the devices, whatever they might be, mm -hmm. um, and working out the routes. Now, my wife at the time, she was, clearly her name was, she was the daughter of a, a big restaurant owner in Melbourne, a bit of a tear away. Her other sisters were settled and married, but clearly it was, you know, always kind of looking for trouble. <laughs> Um, but not that much trouble. She wanted me to get couriers. Like, yeah, okay. But and I did that. But they, I used to worry about them so much because I noticed if they ever had to make a decision, it was a bad one. So I'd be on the same plane. I'd be kind of right behind them, uh, making sure that you know, if something came up, I could intervene. And and the odd thing was, I didn't. I, I, it was good when I sold a load that I brought back, but in a way, I, as time went on, I, I didn't even really like to give it to somebody, you know, like a, um, um, okay, most, my customers were fairly major dealers, so I was protected in a way from any any problems and also protected from being pounced on by Another kind of villain, you know, the kind that goes to uh, drug yeah. dealers and uh, kidnaps them or, or ties them up, takes their money off them. Well, they, they couldn't do that in my case because I made so much money for the really tough ones. That I mean, you yeah. can imagine you. Let's just say you've got something going, and some scallywag uh, has gone to your man and snatched him, nicked the card, uh, nicked the dope, nicked the money. Well, you probably wouldn't take that. Um, uh, it wouldn't take it on the chin, that's for sure. And you might have words with him. Not a lot, 
they'd be few and they'd be brief. <laughs> but uh, so that was a situation that protected me from that. Um, so you were very, so you were very protected by the people that you were doing business with. Yeah, yeah, yeah. People say, "Oh, you get involved with um, big people. Uh, you know, you're stuck there. You, you know, they can force you to do various things." But it wasn't like that. Um, we were all friends for a start. But secondly, you can't say you, you got some computer nerd, right, Decker? Okay, you've got him. You made him comfortable. You've got him in a in a flat somewhere, and he's doing some bit of mischief where you've got loads of Bitcoin coming in from what he's doing. Now you can't upset him. He's a delicate little flower there. You know, you know, you, know, you want to uh, make sure that he doesn't get upset because you can't force somebody into mm -hmm. quality work, can you? David returned to London in 1999. He was then arrested in 2000 in Copenhagen, Denmark. He was arrested at Heathrow Airport in 2002 for smuggling 500 grams of Class A drugs and served two years in prison. His Thai warrant for heroin trafficking remained outstanding, as did a warrant in Australia for breach of parole. You know, people think bribery is an easy thing. It's it's not. It's a very subtle. You know, okay, everything in Thailand was you have to pay for it. Um, mm -hmm. Now, I kind of picked out one of my my personal guard, as it were, who do my bits of business, um, and I gave him two ATM cards. So he would go down to the ATM, take out five hundred, pocket fifty, and give me the rest. And it was a good arrangement. There was several other ways of getting cash in there, but you can imagine, that, oh, the other way you pay 25% and you use the local in-house cell block bank. <laughs> That's a story. But you can imagine, I, I see you're getting onto this. The reason I wanted the guard to do it for me, not just because I'm a cheap bastard and I'd be saving 15%, but because the more of them in there that I was giving little tips to, you know, thank you. Oh, you've made my life easier. It was a real headache getting money to pay for the food here. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Um, so, and the more of the guards that thought I was innocuous, didn't matter. Oh, he's a nerdy sort of, uh, you know, some educated twerp who's got himself in a load of shit, you know. But here's the thing. Um, I needed to relax them. So they wouldn't pay any attention when my hacksaw blades came in a care parcel full of food. Well, of course, they were disguised. They, um, the reason I, I needed to get hacksaw blades was because the scheme where I was going to be smuggled into the prison's auto repair shop and then welded into a VW van, which would be picked up Friday night and, and taken out and I then get out of the van. Uh, that was no good because I would have to trust people. David is a very fascinating character. He had a movie made about his life of the only man to escape from Klong Prem. The movie, Underbelly Files, The Man Who Got Away. To look at David, you wouldn't see a drug smuggler. You'd see more of a college professor. But I'd say this is why he got away with it for so long. You know, you might think, well, shit, David, uh, you're going to make some enemies there doing that kind of thing, even if it is a fake gun. Well, what's the difference? They're going to kill me anyway. <laughs> no. So I saw the, the, the bit of dawn, and I had enough rope, kind of, just inch myself over um, and slide to the ground with my long khaki pants. And I had one other thing that I thought might be useful. I was worried that out there, so many people arriving work different times of the night, my white face. I got, there was a factory in there that made pop-up umbrellas and I got a black one. So once I'm over the wall, the original plan was to put on my clothes and whatnot in a plastic bag, tied up tight, 
get into the moat, swim across to the other side. But I, I, I was out of time for that shit. Not only that, all the guards' houses were on the uh, other, other bank of this thing. I've got like, minutes to get the hell out of there before, you know, a huge number of guards arrived for work. So I've gone round to the front with my pop-up umbrella hugging over my face. There was a little bit of rain, but not much. And I could see, because I cheated a bit, I looked, I looked, I looked, like Ripley in Alien, you know, when she's saying she's trying to get into the spacesuit to save her life. She doesn't want to get eaten. She's going, lucky, lucky, lucky. And that's exactly the words I was using as I neared the front of the building. Because if you go around the front where the moat is, there was a little walkway bridge for a kind of service entrance out there. Um, and I got to that, and it's about five past six, and I could see just through the cracks in my umbrella that my own personal guard, the one who's got my ATM cards, has, um, I bet you he gave those a tap by the end of the day. Um, he just arrived for walk, and, and this is the odd thing. It seemed to me he recognized me, but he wasn't, there's nothing to see. All he could look at was the way I was walking. Now, don't you notice that, you know, you see somebody from a distance out a window in a car park or wherever, and from the way they walk, you say, that's Frank. You know, we, we recognize the, not just the body language, but the body rhythm of how our friends move around. And he looked at this person he couldn't tell whether it was white, Asian, fuck knows. I kept that umbrella low, but there was something so familiar about it, leaving. But, hell, escaping prisoners don't use umbrellas in case they get a little bit wet. <laughs> so I got to the front six-lane highway that goes to the airport, climbed over the pedestrian kind of bridge, um, which was very high up and crossed over. If you go there now, you'll see a second... Um, highway over there as well so it's even more climbing um and i look back on klong prem la Jal, the great prison and thought to myself they're they're all gone they're all in the past why do they stay why why am i here alone why didn't anybody come That concludes the interview with David Macmillan. I had to look twice sometimes during that interview because I couldn't believe that this man was capable of becoming one of Britain's most notorious drug smugglers. The only man to ever escape death row in Klong Prem, Thailand. The most brutal prisons in the world but he's now went on to become a successful author and living a really, really good positive life. But I did wonder during the whole interview, how did David become so successful in smuggling drugs? And the answer to that is, he looks like a college professor. I'm Decker Heggie, and this is the official All or Nothing podcast.